Jonathan Katz and I met during my, exhi during my exhibition on Walt Whitman, and I have to say that the events of the last four months have given us a deeper appreciation of Whitman's poem, We Two Boys Together Clinging. Um, <laughs> it's been, I will just keep this short since Jonathan is well known to all of you, and just to again say what a pleasure it's been to work with Jonathan, I'm immensely proud of the work that we've done here, um, including the work we're presenting today. And today, Jonathan will talk to us about Agnes Martin and abstraction and sexuality. Jonathan. Thank you. Presentation F5. Ah, there we go. There we go. Thank you very much. For most viewers, Agnes Martin's 1963 Night Sea works a slow surprise. Look long enough, and it unemphatically reverses itself, transposing expected relations of identity and priority, the key themes of Martin's poetics. At some point in looking at the painting, unexpectedly and all at once, the image flips 180 degrees. And what we took to be the foreground, the thin white grid incised into an all over blue field, evaporates into a most delicate white reserve of gessoed canvas, a thin tracery ground peeking through an emerging thicket of painstakingly painted small blue rectangles. No longer mere background, this sea of blue rectangles then individuates compelling us to look more closely at the newly autonomous serial blue fields that have suddenly become the subject of this painting. It would be, I think, all a mere parlor trick were it not for the ramifying doubts that such an unexpected reversal engenders. Once the image becomes ground, and the ground image, an unaccustomed vigilance uh, about the adequacy of our vision haunts our seeing, we peer closer in an attempt to confirm one of the two polar options our eyes have offered. Having been initially misled, the careful viewer, unmoored from conventions recognized before they're actually seen, enters a state of heightened sensory awareness. Using the most simple, stripped, bare, indeed self-evident pictorial terms, Night Sea nonetheless instantiates an unexpected gulf between what appears to be true and what is true. Spend enough time with Agnes Martin, look hard enough, read enough of her prescriptions for making art or looking at it, and you enter a world of metaphysical doubt where the eyes lie, rational thought is mere illusion, skepticism is insight, and geometry can become a vehicle of personal expression of a deeply intimate kind. It is a world of feints and distractions, demanding truth strength and perseverance to pierce the veil of the illusory in favor of her favorite word, the true, the, that singular ethical command that animates her writing and her art. Now that's a lot to hang on Night Sea already, but I'm not done. Too many accounts of Martin's work stop near here, either reifying the work's metaphysical prowess or interrogating the means through which it was brought about. When critics recuse the artist in favor of her means, I'm going to argue they unwittingly fall into Martin's own well-made trap, which is to say she set it up, she seeded it, and mediating exactly that response, not only in her paintings, but in her voluminous statements and parables, her aromatic self-sufficiency, her zen-inflected paeans to humility, all of which serve to underscore that there's nothing individuated, nothing private, nothing personal, nothing encoded in her art. Paradoxically, the more Agnes Martin exposed her feelings and thoughts and aims as an artist, the more evanescent she became, the less obviously a mediator of her own meaning. But what if instead of playing along, we tried to see beyond this authorial transparency and ask why in the first place an artist would strive to erect a Trojan horse of signification, seeking to elevate the operations of meaning-making ahead of the maker of meaning herself. 
What if we stopped mimicking Martin's own self-repressions and instead attended to the evidence of agency in her work, thereby finding a way out of the mirrored cell where she authored our anti-authorial interpretations of her work? Suspended over this analysis, like a pictorial metaphor, is Night C, with its penchant for inversion, its suspended oppositions, its thematization of a gulf between appearance and the real, and its tendency to actively and repeatedly recast itself in terms of its own identity as an object. In its split ontology, Night C mirrors the bifurcated construction of perception that, mir that Martin once posited behind and before self-expression is a developing awareness in the mind that affects the work. This developing awareness I will also call the work, end quote. Note that within this ontological narrative, as in many of Martin's and in much of Zen thought, there's the implication of a binary or bifurcated reality. This split conceptualization of what is generally understood as singular and whole implies an investment in a new, more accurate system that dismisses appearance as mere illusion and rewards renewed attentiveness to what lies beneath. Note too that this two-part purchase on the real is complete and totalizing. In other words, it's not part of Night Sea that changes when you finally realize how it's made, it's its entireness. Critics have repeatedly characterized Martin's mature works in terms of a kind of tense stasis in which oppositions are neither transcended on one hand nor synthesized in the other, but are rather suspended and contained. Indeed, the more Martin attends to the surface of her works, betraying the idiosyncratic marks of her hand and her process, the more transcendental the work comes to seem, fleeing from the particular into the universal. But Martin's spiritual and pictorial pursuit can, I believe, be rescued from inchoate suggestion and my coy play with a historical vocabulary of sexual difference, the ones I've been employing here, I think, uh, pretty manifestly up till now, all this talk of identity and inversion, of bifurcation and the difference between surface and depth, and will become, I hope, manifest as a form of queer self-realization written paradoxically through an anti-identitarian, Zen-informed idiom. That her art was never intended as a provocative exegesis or acknowledgement of her sexuality is a given. But where would we be if we made acknowledgement the truth test of art historical knowledge? Besides, it's best hubristic to demand that the expression of se sexual difference come in forms that we readily understand. The great paradox in Martin is that absence, abandonment, and renunciation became her chosen modes of self-expression. Perhaps this was because she felt that in her early work, the self-expression was too naked, too literal, and I mean that literally, this is an image of Martin before a female nude that is now in the exhibition upstairs. This is the first time it's been seen publicly. There it is. Martin destroyed the vast majority of her early work, but there survives this female nude from around 1949. And Martin tells her, tell, herself tells us that another early painting uh, from around 1951 and now sadly destroyed was entitled Fathers and Sons. And that painting, which won the first prize at the Taos Art Fair, was described by Martin in an early article by Lizzie Borden um, and as follows. Martin has indicated that the subject of the painting is a father worrying that his son is not masculine enough, forgetting that sons are not born manly, end quote. Nude portraits of women fraught scenes of gender nonconformity are hardly what we think of when we think of Agnes Martin. But that it came to be the case is itself a telling art historical development. Now, the representational yardstick generally used to measure the import of different sexualities in art history always seems to me almost intentionally crude, assigning significance only if sexuality is the depicted subject of the work of art. What if instead we were to embrace a more complete and complex taxonomy? one that registered sexual nonconformity in abstract art as well. In terms of process, reference, emotion, expression, 
and their numerous respective blockages and renunciations, part of that whole other structure beyond subject matter that has always undergirded and informed art's meaning making. In short, if we come to understand Martin's sexuality as a species of standpoint epistemology, we'll find that it can not only go a long way towards contextualizing her multiple renunciations and repressions, including her very idiosyncratic theories on art and on Zen, on personal and collective politics, but it can also, and most rewardingly, help us to see what gives her paintings their power. That tense equilibrium, as in Nietzsche, instantiated but never reconciled between opposing pictorial terms. Despite the centrality of Martin's transformative years in her New York studio in Coenty Slip, where she finally hit upon the pictorial means that would sustain all her mature work, the specific social character of what was then one of America's only largely queer artistic enclaves is almost never mentioned. Yet Martin lived with her partner, and here's a work of her partner, Lenore Tawney, we've seen a piece earlier today, within a few blocks of um, much of the early post-abstract expressionist queer avant-garde, ranging from artists that she knew only glancingly, such as John Cage and Merce Cunningham, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Cy Twombly, to those true intimates who made up her immediate circle. Among the latter, we know of Ellsworth Kelly, with whom she had breakfast every single day, of her affection for Robert Indiana, who was uh, Kelly's partner at the time, of her abiding closeness and understanding with Ann Wilson, and of course, most centrally, with her partner, Tawny. Importantly, it was here, among this quasi-family of mostly other queer artists, that Martin finally made work that satisfied her, work that she did not subsequently try to destroy wholesale, as she did try to destroy the painting upstairs, even if, after moving to New Mexico, she largely left this queer social world behind. How did it come to pass, in short, that her mature style first emerged within the only queer social context she would ever really know? And as a corollary, how do we make sense of her abandonment of that world at the moment of her greatest artistic success? Martin marks her sexuality, in part through her fluency in an Eastern philosophy that is, it seems, light years from questions of sexuality, and I'm talking about Zen. Only in retrospect does it make sense that the zenith of Zen Buddhism's influence in American cultural life was probably the mid-1950s. Zen's rapid cultural ascent, however, had an Achilles heel. At the height of the so-called Lavender Scare, when more homosexuals than communists lost their jobs and endured public excoriation and judicial persecution, the leading proponents of an American Zen aesthetic were largely, though not exclusively, homosexual. Composers such as John Cage and Lou Harrison, poets like Allen Ginsberg and visual artists like Mark Toby, all produced work clearly indebted to Zen precepts. Martin, too, belongs in this company, and though she was not a practicing Buddhist, she often did her best to look and sound like one. Lore has it that Zen Buddhism was born of the so-called flower sermon, in which the Supreme Buddha gathered all his disciples together and in lieu of speaking simply held up a flower saying nothing. One disciple, gazing at the flower, finally smiled in understanding and was acknowledged by the Buddha. Thus Zen, like the visual arts, came to elevate knowledge as a function of the wordless, individuated, and direct experience of the visual ahead of any written creed. Where most religions, right, view revelation as textual, Zen understood it as individuated, visual, and experiential, to the turning of the eye inward. Martin's mature paintings have been widely discussed in terms of this inward-focused eye, and their combination of rigorous discipline, painstaking execu execution, and transcendental ambitions have clear affinities with Zen. The grid, with its equilibrium of verticals and horizontals, its inherent limitlessness, its seamless incorporation of any singularity into an overarching structure become a kind of metaphor for Zen's pursuit of that meditative liminal state where the interior and the exterior world meet. The repeated invocation of water in Martin's early titles, I'm showing you here um, the water-influenced falling blue, but I could just as well show you, for example, Dark River, amplifies this Zen connection for water is perhaps the most important metaphor of Zen consciousness. Any single drop of water 
has in essence been reincarnated in numerous states, from the body of a dinosaur to our own bodies, from rivulet to creek to river to ocean to rain to our faucet today, always different and always the same, the material time-traveling incarnation of the Zen vision of the interconnectedness across time, space, and being. Like us, each drop of water is from one vantage point individual and unique, and yet, of course, from another vantage point, it exists merely as an instantiation of a much, much broader continuum. Meditation is in part an attempt to quiet the hungry ego, to unlearn our singularity and catch a glimpse of our participation in that continuum. As Martin put it in her untroubled mind, by looking into my mind, I can see what's there. By bringing my thoughts to the surface, I watch them dissolve." End quote. For closeted homosexuals, such as Martin, at the height of the Zen, uh, of the Cold War, rather, Zen offered a distinctly different and far more salutary relationship to prescribed identity than did the dominant Western tradition. In Western thought, not to address or articulate something was, of course, right to repress it. Following the propositions of Freud and others, repression, of course, had but two courses, either to stay dammed up and to fester or to catastrophically burst through. Both formulations thus held the closet as an evasion that would ultimately wreak emotional havoc. But since homosexuality was then literally against the law, the Western tradition had only the bleakest of, pro of prospects to offer. On the other hand, Zen proposed silence as healthy and productive. This, uh, in allowing thoughts to arise and disappear without making them real, right? The self was less enthralled to the illusion of its own autonomy and better able to sound its deep connection to other forms of being. Paradoxically, the evasion of sexual difference, inevitably, right, sorrowful in the Western tradition, the closet in short, became in Zen its own palliative. No wonder closeted homosexuals like Martin chose a Zen ethos in a violently repressive era. It alone proffered salve. But the problem with this Zen analytic frame, which is, I think, the key strain in Martin's criticism, is that it negates precisely the sexual and bodily dimensions that animated Martin's embrace of Zen in the first place. In her first person account called Encounter with Agnes Martin, the German writer Marisha Burkhardt counters this disembodied Zen tradition with a description of the artist that is notably corporeal. She tells us, um, as she, uh, struggling, she says, to convey, quote, the ribaldry and mystique of Agnes Martin, and notes that the sole decorations in Martin's humble adobe are, quote, five cheap prints of Coca-Cola girls in their underwear purchased at the five and dime. She then quotes Lus Martin's very lusty response to that observation. Why do I have them? Well, they've got everything I haven't got. That this is an unknown Martin, is in part a function of the Zen analytic tradition and in part a function of Martin's own supremely careful self-editing. Few artists are as completely framed by their own words and yet remain so personally off limits. Yet according to Mary Fuller McChesney in her 1994 interview with Susan Landauer, that's now upstairs in the archive of American art, there was always more than a whiff of calculation to the development of Martin's visionary persona. According to the archive, Mary Fuller says this, Talk about a manipulator. Agnes Martin was like that. When I first met Aggie Martin in New York, I mean New Mexico boy in what, 1950? She was painting these kind of funky surrealist paintings and she said, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it and I don't care who I have to fuck or how I have to do it, I'm gonna make it. And she wasn't kidding. And she was a real drinker too. And she was so curious, I liked her a lot. She was very interesting, very strange. She was in love with Ed, but she was kind of gay, I think. And now all these things of New York are totally, totally different from the story she told us about her background. And the interviewer says, you mean in the profile? And Mary says, yeah, she's rewriting her whole history. Why not? End quote. Whatever the actual veracity of this account, it is surely true that despite the rhetoric of humility and egolessness, Martin stands out even among other post-war artists for her insistent and oracular and frequently prescriptive proclamations. The paradoxical result is that with rare exception, one of the most idiosyncratic, insistent voices in contemporary art has actually camouflaged the artist behind it. 
Yet her epigrammatic statements, lovingly transcribed, supremely quotable, are always more than Gnostic commentary from an enlightened hermit. They have been, from the very beginning, part of her signifying practice. Especially since her 1973 exhibition at the ICA, um, her first groundbreaking exhibition, Martin's statements have almost always accompanied her work. And while I don't want to suggest that Martin's um, discursive self-portrayal was always deliberately camouflage, it surely sometimes was. Brendan Prendeville discovered that a Gertrude Stein quotation reproduced in an artist statement accom that accompanied Martin's second New York exhibition at the Betty Parsons Gallery in 1959 was a literary wink to that small and deeply interested population intimately familiar with Gertrude Stein's lesbian love poetry. Martin's statement quoted the following lines from Gertrude Stein. In which ways are stars brighter than they are? When we've come to this decision, we mention many thousands of buds, and when I close my eyes, I see them, end quote. But as Prendeville noted, the unquoted lines that immediately followed Martin's selection are among the most directly declarative of lesbianism in Stein's entire output. Even one of the poem's titles, it has two, not so obliquely references same-sex desire. I dem the same, it's called. And these are those lines that follow it. If you hear her snore, it's not before you love her. You love her so that to be her beau is very lovely. She is sweetly here and her little feet are stretched out well, which is a treat and very lovely. Her little tender nose is between her little eyes, which close and are very lovely. She is very lovely and mine, which is very lovely." End quote. Two things are going on here. And importantly, they're conflated. Martin is referencing a lesbian verse, but at the same time, she's careful not to publish it in its entirety. Yet equally, she finds in the sense of Stein's poem something markedly congruent with her own aesthetic philosophy. Stein asks, of course, in what way are stars brighter than they are? And she an essentially answers, when I close my eyes. In other words, the stars are brighter in the mind, in recollection, through an act of cognition manifesting an almost Proustian divide between the experience in itself and its recollection or construction in the mind is, of course, as we've seen, a key Martin theme. But Martin's confident devaluation of central experience, sensual experience is not only foreign to Stein's pluralistic acceptance of all forms of subjectivity, it sits especially uncomfortably alongside a text given over, after all, to the celebrating of the sensuality of lesbian love of hearing her snore and enjoying the sight of her feet, which are stretched out and really lovely, that Martin chose to quote a poem of distinctly lesbian erotic content, only to frame it in terms of a devaluation of sensory experience is pretty telling. Sexuality is the motive for her turn away from sensory knowledge in favor of the transcendental. And so we come to the crux of the issue. How is it possible to reconcile Martin's repeated devaluations of the sensual world, ranging from everyday sensory data of the world around us to actual lesbianism, with her manifest faith in its power in the workings of her art? To paint is necessarily to appeal to the senses, and her paintings, above many, are celebrated, and I think rightly, for their slow accumulation of a lush physicality. When, as Martin once put it, I got on the right track, her work finally resolved itself around a series of taught and self-evident dualities that do not so much resolve as suspend the oppositions in her work. Lawrence Alloway, the critic, said it best when he noted that in the catalog uh, for her first exhibition, quote, as she draws it, the grid is halfway between a rectangular system of coordinates and a veil. Martin's work, unquote, Martin's work is material thus that leads the viewer beyond materiality. Like the grid itself, in which verticals and horizontals interweave to produce an image that is more than the sum of its parts, never just one thing or the other, but always right both, Martin's mature work is a tensile structure, a knitting of oppositions together. Martin's deliberate search for variations on the pictorial realization of equilibrium not only underscores that balancing is her defining value, it also raises the question why. Through cow, oh, that's Greystone, sorry. Through cow, painted in that defining year of Martin's development, 1960, we can begin to recognize sexual difference as, in fact, the ground of her thinking. 
A single circle set within a square field, Cal seems to be yet another formal investigation into the pictorializing of a binary in, op in, in suspended uh, opposition, in stasis. But Cal has a substantial referential subtext, or actually two. One was discovered um, uh, by Jacqueline Boss, who notes that Cal reveals a familiarity with a key text in the Zen tradition, published in English by none other than D.T. Suzuki, whose book, The Manual of Zen Buddhism, contains a section on the famous ox herding pictures, a series of 10 pictorial analogs that represent different stages of enlightenment, employing the figure of an ox herd and an ox. One of these images, the ox and the man both gone out of sight, is reproduced in Suzuki's book as an empty circle in a square, exactly like you're looking at here, signifying a mind emptied of ego and thus attuned to more transcendental perceptions. Suzuki's widely influential text and illustration may even inform that section of Martin's Untroubled Mind where she says, and here I quote her, I painted a painting called Milk River. Cows don't give milk if they don't have grass and water. Living is grazing. Memory is chewing cud. Everyone is chosen and everyone knows it, end quote. But in addition to the Zen ox herding pictures, there exists, you'll forgive the term, another bovine protagonist Martin would certainly have known. Testimony to the ready confluence of Zen with questions of sexuality, because the term cow is a repeated motif in none other than Gertrude Stein's erotic love poetry. Two poems in particular, Lifting Belly from 1915, and As a Wife Has a Cow, A Love Story from 1926, both feature the word cow in numerous specifically lesbian contexts. They are not only long love poems to Alice B. Toklas, her partner, they are among the most erotically charged lesbian literature of the first half of the 20th century. In both poems, Stein's signature repetitive style seems to break free from its formal rationale, becoming instead animated by an uncharacteristic, at least for Stein, um, mimesis, an attempt to mirror in the structure of the poem what the poem itself is talking about. In Lifting Belly, her phrases track sexual acts, the words redoubling, rocking back and forth on themselves, enforcing unnatural catchings of breath until the reader and the poem's lovers are conjoined and the text's repetitions build slowly into a crescendo that culminates in an orgasm. The text's punning name, Caesar, which was of course one of Toklas's pet names for Gertrude Stein, only amplifies the erotic charge as Caesar, the Roman name, becomes instead in her punning language, sees her. Let me quote Stein, and you'll see what I mean about the rhythm of the words. I say lifting belly, and then I say lifting belly and Caesar's. I say lifting belly gently and Caesar's gently. I say lifting belly again and Caesar's again. I say lifting belly and I say Caesar's. I say lifting belly and Caesar's and cow come out. I say lifting belly and Caesar's and cow come out and cow come out. Thus cow in Stein's private language, that which seizes up her upon her lifting of belly, denotes an orgasm, as numerous studies of Pine, Stein's poetics attest. Strange as it may sound, in Martin's own pictorial private language, Zen meditation and lesbian orgasm merge under the sign cow as different facets of a similar transcendental impulse. One, of course, somatic, the other spiritual. But the, that difference seems insignificant in comparison to what they share, an experience of imminence, one that is not just imaginative or purely cognitive, but lived through. Both states entail a rare instance of boundarylessness, of being here and there, of living, so to speak, across the binary, on the potential of the body to transport one beyond corporeality. Stein is every bit as eloquent as Suzuki, but in a different key. And in this moment of transformative dissolve, Martin finally came to understand what she was after. And in a word, it's freedom, as she put it in her untroubled mind. When I was painting in New York, I was not so clear about that. Now I'm very clear that the object is freedom, not political freedom, which is the echo, not the freedom from social mores, freedom from mastery and from slavery, freedom from what's dragging you down, freedom from right and wrong. When you give up the idea of right and wrong, you don't get anything. What you do is get rid of everything." End quote. Here, finally, we can catch a, 
undistorted glimpse of Ma Martin's model of liberation. Though largely expounded as a compound of multiple negations, Martin is clear about what freedom she's not proposing as she is about what she seeks. And her central point is that she's not advocating any kind of accommodation with current society, working towards political freedom or freedom from social mores, um, only makes right the way we live the only possible ground of social reform. Rather, Martin offers a cascading series of negatives. What you do is get rid of everything. An absolutely antithetical non-accommodationism becomes her form of transcendentalism. As a result, Martin stages a binary at every turn. Every element demands its negating counterpoint. And as we've seen, this achieves material cognate in her art. Thus, the key question in understanding Martin is this. What is the value in her art and in her thought of the recurrent staging of oppositions? One prospect immediately suggests itself. At least since Hegel, the dialectic has been the defining model of Western thought, projecting the inexorable movement of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, finally yielding a new thesis and thereupon a new cycle of value in and of itself. The dialectic embodies a linear forward march view of history, but the dialectic premised on the belief that superior formulations follow right inferior ones and supersede them necessarily implies a move towards resolution, being an equilibrium between opposing forces, and in so doing supplants a model of dialectical progress with a kind of tense stasis, or perhaps better said, supplants um, resolution with repetition. In this model, as in Martin's art generally, each instance of dialectical opposition is not resolved, cannot be resolved, so much as it is modeled again and again. Think of a grid, right? You can't resolve that. It's always going to be, right, two things in stasis. As with Shiva's cycles of birth and destruction, there's no progress here. There's no escape through a higher cognition. There's no resolution. There's only duration, the ex acceptance of a permanent and irresolvable cycle. Highly instrumentalized, this repetition is Martin's goal. And endurance becomes her value because in being undialectical, it's incompatible with power. After all, the structure of the dialectic echoes the structure of power, contestation, conquest, hierarchy. But equilibrium and repetition not only frustrate the, that structure, they halt it completely. And importantly, for a largely closeted lesbian, they do so not by posing a positive, identifiable value against it, which would merely be another turn in the dialectical cycle, but by seeking to interrupt the process of dialectical thought entirely. It should come as no surprise, then, to find Martin in her what is real interested in the idea of power. She says, now we must consider the idea of power because without freedom, we cannot make our full response. With the idea of power in our minds, we are subject to that power. If you believe in it, then it exists and you are subject to it. But in reality, there is no power anywhere, end quote. Thus, power is not a material entity, but a mental construct, and as such, capable of being undone only through a kind of mental rehabituation, a retraining of the West cognitive assumptions away from a dialectical point of view. In Martin's particular utopia, to unseat the dialectic is to unseat power. In this pursuit, if she can show that power is not something outside the self, she can interrupt the naturalized and deeply destructive dialectical process at its root. Martin is explicit that the goal of her revolution in consciousness is to deracinate the hold of the natural, the normal, and all those other ideological conventions on our lives. She says, everything we know and everything anyone else knows is conditioned. The conditioning goes all the way back through evolution. The conditional life, the natural life, the conventional life, they're all the same thing." End quote. In closing, I will admittedly, ham-fistedly, lead a, yet another cow onto stage. Not Zen ox herding pictures, not Stein's orgasmic cow, but actually Friedrich Nietzsche's famous cow at the beginning of the second section of his untimely meditations, the section that he entitles on the uses and disadvantages of history for life. Nietzsche argues that because a cow has no grasp of history, which is to say no memory, living as it does entirely in the moment, contentedly chewing its cud, a cow can experience neither boredom nor pain. 
But neither, he says, can a cow experience true happiness because to be happy is necessarily a comparative state, given meaning only in relation to past states of unhappiness. Without memory, without a sense of history, one may be happy, but there's no way to confirm it. And so that which confers happiness, the absence of memory, also undercuts it. This enables Nietzsche to argue for a kind of willful, willful forgetting in relation to history, people, in relation to history, because people, unlike cows, can willfully forget that which they know. Nietzsche argues it follows. The case, I'm quoting him here, the case of the smallest or the greatest happiness is always the same thing that makes happiness happiness. The ability to forget, or expressed in more scholarly fashion, the capacity to feel unhistorically during its duration, end quote. This capacity to feel unhistorically during its duration is what Martin is reaching for in her art. It is a kind of willful forgetting that is for her true freedom. Memory, thought, category, resolution, these cognitive dimensions must be willfully forgotten in favor of what she understands as pure perception. For Martin, art is an act of willful forgetting, a turning away of the mind from thought and back towards perception. It may even have been a nod to Nietzsche's cow when Martin wrote in The Untroubled Mind in terms so resonant, re re resonant of this allegory, living is grazing, memory is chewing cud. Martin's disciplined achievement of formal equilibrium thus becomes an incarnation through perception of the forgetting of history that is for her true freedom. Thank you.